So how about this? Um, hi, it's Maxine Dugan with another uh, edition of Dominate the Nation. I'm with my special guest today, Anita Danfra Anita D. Francesco. Did I say that right this time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> awesome. We're here to talk about um, her uh, cousin, Donna Gentili, uh, who was killed in 1985 and whose murder is still unsolved. So Donna's name came up. This is what happened, Anita. Donna's name came up. Bella Robinson and I were talking about, we did a YouTube on the uh, Long Island serial killer and how the Soulful County uh, uh, a district attorney is going to go into all the jails and talk to women who've been arrested for prostitution to see if they've had any connection with Rex, who's a stand accused of, you know, killing six women. Mm. And so, um, you know, Donna's name came up because we were talking about how dicey it was going to be, uh, you know, for women in that situation to be in jail and to be approached by the district attorney's office to talk, you know, about this serial killer. And, you know, what a, what a really difficult position that puts women who are criminalized, you know, for working in, in prostitution. And, um, you know, how really that was gonna work out for, um, you know, how is that really gonna work out for the case against Rex? Um, mm. So right. we, we were talking about Donna. So, um, so I know that you wrote the book about Donna and, um, you know, have been trying to get her case uh, to be solved, you know, quite frankly. So a yeah, long time. It's for almost 40 years. And uh, but her case is, you know, different. I mean, she wasn't killed by a serial killer. We don't think so. I mean, no. there's always that. There's always the possibility. She was a working girl in El Cajon Boulevard and working the streets. And um, but it's not likely because of her story and her background and what happened with the police that she did a testimony and two policemen were fired. Of course, Lieutenant Black uh, got his job back, but demoted from a lieutenant. And the other one, Larry Averick, he was, you know, fired completely. So with her, that and her background was kind of, you know, put her in imminent danger because she, you know, she became afraid then at the time and sent us letters saying my life is in danger. She had to do a little jail time, but she was being helped and had a, a work furlough from Lieutenant Carl Black, who was on her side, who help, was helping her. Mm. He, he, li he liked her. You know, he liked her as a person, a lover, a, a sex trading, whatever, you know, mm -hmm. you know, a working girl, whatever, but he liked her and yeah. he helped her. He helped her. And she had aspirations to move on. She actually wanted to be in law enforcement. I think if Donna were alive today, she would have been like a high powered attorney of some sort. Mm -hmm. You know, well, she would have law enforcement kind from law enforcement to lawyer because she was, well, she had a, yeah. Yeah. Let, let's play the video of her um from you know uh that you know that we have we have some actual video of her video of her and kind of describing what she went through in you know this informant situation that law enforcement put her in and you know just just the bad bad situation there so hang on one second let's play that for the audience Two-year-old Donna Gentili, a convicted prostitute, was found murdered two weeks ago. Her body, discovered near Pine Valley, had been badly beaten and strangled. There was no sign of a struggle. There are no suspects. Five weeks earlier, Gentili had testified at former police officer Larry Averick's hearing. Averick, fired from the police department in January, was trying to get his job back. He was fired because he provided a non-prostitute with... with inappropriate information about what police activities were going to be uh, taking place along El Cajon Boulevard in regard to prostitution. Uh, for, the, for what pur purpose? For the purpose of keeping her from being arrested uh, by uh, undercover operations. Gentili claimed Avrick also had sex with her, but that could not be substantiated. 
Avrik says he was using Gentili to obtain information about misconduct on the part of his superior officer, Lieutenant Carl Black. I had information that I had received from a known prostitute involving higher-ups on the police department that a lieutenant had taken a known prostitute to the Colorado River and paid her $500 on two occasions and uh, set that prostitute up with a, another sergeant from the police department. Black was subsequently demoted to sergeant. His case is also on appeal. Gentilly had maintained all along that Black was trying to help her get off the streets. Gentilly's attorney says it was Avrik she was afraid of. For the last seven or eight, nine months, she had indicated to me that she feared for her life that uh, from the time that she had made a complaint against uh, a member of the police force, uh, she, she feared retaliation. Had he ever made any threats to her? To my knowledge, no. Gentilly, who was convicted of prostitution, began serving a 90-day jail sentence March 13th. On that day, she handed her attorney an audio tape. She instructed me to give them to a member of the media and asked, that they be played in the event that something happened to her. So she was anticipating her death? She was fearful of her death. Well, Donna Gentile has been called a convicted prostitute, a liar, a person who would burn members of the police department. During what would you call her? How would you describe her? The record will show she was a convicted prostitute, whatever that means. Uh, a liar she was not. Out to burn a cop? No. Interesting. Yeah, I always love that. That's the tape that Jerry Limburg, Jerry Limburg did that video. Yeah, um, you know, but um, you know, it's it's true. Her lawyer was so compassionate toward her. He really understood her and knew her, who she was. So naturally, labeling will go on. You're a, you're out to burn a cop because you got one fired. So labeling is a normal, and name calling is a normal part of the American culture. You know what I mean? It's it's the, the normal part of the American. Oh, you got a cop fired? Oh, you're 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 a cop killer, you know, or you're a cop burner, whatever. So, but Donna wasn't really that Larry Averick, which I have met him twice, and we interviewed each other for our books. And mm. I mean, I like the guy. Yeah, sure, I know him. I you know he's passed just recently. He passed a mm. month ago, and um, he had some heart condition or something. Um, but the thing is, I I just think that. Um, what had happened was he was very uh, becoming very crazed on her, so to speak. You know, mm -hmm. he was pushing for that information. Back then it was it was photographs. It wasn't like a JPEG or anything. He wanted the photographs from the Colorado River because everybody would use the regular cameras and take pictures then. And she kind of, she didn't want to give them. So he pressured her for this. And that was going to be his golden ticket to show the higher ups, the IA, hey, look what your lieutenant's doing. And he's still a lieutenant, like, you know, and, I, and, I, and he felt he since he had gotten demoted in his job when he took her on the ride along. I don't know if you know that part. He took her on a ride along way back before all this. Now, you know what a ride along is, right? Yeah. OK. He took her on the ride along because she said, I want to go on a ride along and I want to learn what it's like to be a policeman. And they they um, got on him because he didn't know that she was a, a prostitute. And so they felt the department felt like, oh, he took a prostitute on a ride along. What else are you doing? You know, well, and, and, so and, and rightly so, you know, because th this is the problem with criminalization. You know, it puts um, it puts everything that we do uh, in in a questionable state. And all the people around us who are involved with us in any capacity are all um, put in up to this, you know, scrutiny uh, because of the criminalization of our occupation. If she had been any other type of, you know, worker that wasn't criminalized, you know, uh, all this wouldn't have happened. Um, but I just think it's just really... Um, <clears throat> um, telling that these two cops are like you know going at each other over her right but the thing was see larry Avrick, it was a, it was job politics donna just got caught in the middle 
Mm. It wasn't about Donna and it wasn't about romance or love or sex. I mean, a paid prostitute, you know, it's you pay the prostitute, you have sex. It wasn't about love. Believe me, they weren't in love with her. But I think that Black had a little soft side for her. You know, he had a little bit of a soft side for her. Um, actually, I believe Larry did as well. And um, but the thing is, it was more or less about that Larry was jealous of Black, that Black could the, what's good for the goose isn't good for the gander. So Black could go out with the prostitutes, but he couldn't because he got demoted when he took a prostitute on a ride along way back, way five years before all this. Wait, when he, he took, took a different prostitute on a ride along? No, he took Donna oh, he on the Donna. ride along five years before, you know, go back, go back five he years. He had a before. long relationship. Well, it's only been five years that she was in San Diego. That was it, five short years. But in the beginning when she moved there is when she met Larry and he took her on the ride along. He didn't know she had just got arrested for prostitution because they have to hand in paperwork when they do a ride along. They have to do an evaluation, all of that kind of stuff. She has to sign. And when they saw her name, they go, she's a, she's a prostitute. She's one of the girls on the street. What are you taking her on a ride along for? You know, like, and uh, he said, well, I didn't know that. And they demoted him then. So mm -hmm. he felt like they demoted him because he took a prostitute out. But meanwhile, Black is going on these Colorado River trips every weekend, which are understood with different prostitutes. And they have the dates for the different lieutenants. And he could do that. So Larry felt like, well, if he could do that. Well, why can't I? Why did I get demoted? So that was the big fight. Larry was fighting for the same. What's good for the goose is good for the gander. Black was, Av Black was Av Avrook's boss, Larry's boss. Oh, so they all wanted to be able to take prostitutes to the Colorado River and pay for sex and have well, that. Whatever. Deal. But see, Larry just got caught up in the beginning. It was like he took this girl, he made her fill out the papers, and then they go, Donna Gentilly? She, she's one of the prostitutes we just arrested. You're taking her on a ride along? What are you doing as a cop? You know? And then his whole career went down from that moment. From that moment, they did not like him. They they put him on the outs. He was like on the outs within the department. So he was the guy like you go to your job and you know how there's always one person that's kind of gets bullied or whatever. He was that one. And this is what made him so angry. But who killed Donna? <laughs> that's the question. That's a bit. That's the name. Of, yeah. He his book, Who Murdered Donna Gentile, is for vindication for himself because they he he and Black were always persons of interest. You know, uh, anyone could have done they it. Were. Yeah, I mean, you know, any they could have hired a hitman to do it. Come on. The police department can do what they want. They can hire a crazy guy that's mentally ill and groom him and say, go shoot this girl or go kill this girl, you know. And but they she didn't die of a gunshot they, wound. She didn't die right. of a gunshot wound. Right, but they could still have gotten a crazy guy that's kind of likes likes doing weird things, strangling women or whatever, watches weird movie flicks, and that had a mental illness. He they could have, which I believe me, it would have been too much. It would have been how, easier how to did, do a gun. How did, you, how did you find out about Donna's death? Well, Donna is my first cousin, so my mother. Uh, her brother lived with us in Philadelphia. Donna's from Philadelphia as well, Pennsylvania. Um, when she, her brother lived, my mother was a legal guardian of her and her brother because oh. her father died, but her mother went on to remarry and the stepfather was, we're not going to get into it, but allegedly was doing wrong things to her. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And so she ran away. Mm -hmm. see, she hates, she didn't want to talk. Her mother didn't believe her. Now you're going back, greater Philadelphia, 1980s. Mm -hmm. You think the mother, the mother meets the man of her dreams after her husband dies. I'm not going to believe that my husband's doing this to my daughter. So mm. she went on, she went on the man's side. And that's what the woman did back then. So Donna got angry and said, you don't believe me. I have all the letters, all this stuff. It's all in the letters. You don't believe me. You don't believe me. And I, I'm not coming home at night because so she would she ran off and then she uh, went. So her stepdad and my aunt put her in a, a, a delinquent home, the Tabber home for delinquent children, which was right in the neighborhood where she was where she was living. And why would you want to be in a home when your your family house is down the street? Hello. And you have parents. You know what I mean? 
So mm -hmm. remember, her father had died, which was my mother's brother. That's how we are mm -hmm. first cousins. Mm -hmm. um, and her brother came to live with us because he didn't have, he was underage. And so all my mother's sisters, they all got together and they said, who will take him on? So he came with us because he didn't want to go with his mother and the stepfather for, for different reasons. The mother and him had a lot of estrangement going on. And then the stepfather, the brother didn't like what he heard about the stepfather and Donna, you know, so her brother came to us and Donna basically was ours. She's basically my sister. So, um, first cousin sister, but, um, all the letters she and everything. Away. Came. She ran huh? away, but she ended she up running away. Well, she ran away with a girlfriend. They took a bus and she went to San Diego and she had a horse. She was very level-headed. She, How you know, did she liked... go to San Diego of all places? Well, you know, San Diego, they took a bus, her and the girl from the uh, Tabber home. The girlfriend went back home to Philadelphia. I moved to LA for 20 years. I, I still have a condo there. <laughs> I mean, why did I go to LA? And now I'm back in Philly, provincial Philly. I don't like Philadelphia, <laughs> but I still got my, L my LA condo. But she went there because, you know, I think the bus just let them off somewhere and that's where they ended up. <laughs> Maybe it was one of the stops. Who knows? But it couldn't be because that was like the end of the road. <laughs> Do you think, Anita, she, was, she had started working the streets before she got to uh, San Diego? Not really. Maybe dibbling mm. and dabbling. Um, mm. There might have been some, there might have been some like, um, you know, she was running to her girlfriends. They might have been loving each other in, in different ways, in bisexual ways, maybe, you know, maybe mm. there's a little bit of drugs. Uh, I don't really think that she was... I'm sure she was having sex with boys, but uh, I don't really think, I think when she got to LA, she got a little groomed. I mean, not LA, uh, San Diego groomed uh, somewhat. But she, but she, so she was 17 when she got to San Diego. Right. But she was in the Tabber home need? for, she was in the Tabber home for a year, the delinquent home. So but she meets you, these cops right away, because if you're a street based girl, you're going to meet some cops right away. Well, I'll tell you why I think it all happened out there. There were things going on in Philly. She was staying out all night. She didn't want to go home. I don't blame her because from allegedly what the stepfather, you know, what she claimed in the letter, what wasn't a comfortable situation for her. And uh, so she didn't want to go home. So she'd stay out all night at different friends' homes. They would drink. You know, she was, what, 15, 14? The normal thing that kids do, whether they have issues at home or not. You know, so and she's writing letters to you back in your family back in Philadelphia. Um, so you guys knew something was wrong. Right. Well, when she got there, she says, I'm, I'm in the streets and I don't and they're doing a curfew. There was some kind of curfew. And if you were seven under 17 or under 18, you would be arrested if you were on the street. Mm -hmm. I remember and one of the letters says something about a curfew and she had nowhere to live. And she mm. said she had, so she decided to work the streets so she could make money and get mm -hmm. an apartment. Mm -hmm. Now she had social security checks that were social security checks from her, the, her deceased father that they, she was supposed to get those checks, but her mom didn't give them to her. Now that would have provided her an apartment because back then you didn't have that much. And the social security checks would have been enough to get a rent a room or something. So she tried to go to Social Security and get the Social Security checks. And they were only good until she was 18, because after that, once yeah. a, father, a parent dies after 18, her, her mom kept them. We don't know if her mom, my aunt, was keeping them to save the money for her but, or being spiteful because you ran away. But she certainly was supposed to have that money. And that is why in the letter she kept saying mean things like, Mommy, her mom, mommy's going to pay for this one day because she's going to pay for this one day. It's almost like the vindictiveness, the self, the self, the self. Well, yeah, she was mad. Her, her mom left her, you know, uh, abused and homeless. Yeah. She's mad. Yeah. Right. 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 Makes right. Sense. And the fact that the mother didn't, the mother didn't believe her. And so she ran away and then didn't give her the money. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I don't want to say that her mom was evil, but it's abandonment. And well, then, yeah. then she wished she became resilient. So she became friendly with cops because when because she was you working, have to when you're a street girl, that that's something that's yeah. typical. I mean, but we saw had, that in, in the Celeste Guap case here in Oakland, you know, that as a teenager, you know, the Oakland police were paying her for sex 
as a 13 year old. Yeah. Mm, mm. Well, Donna, I think she was pretty sharp in, in the way of networking. It seemed, it seemed like she networked and she knew everyone and they liked her. The cops respected her. I mean, she, she had a lot of different things. Look how, pretty she, look how pretty she was. She's beautiful. Yeah. She had nice blue eyes, blue or hate, I think ha blue hazel eyes. You know, actually she and I resemble a little bit, a little bit, we resemble. You can see we're first cousins, you know, mm -hmm. a, li a little bit. I mean, not from that picture on the book, but. So how did you uh, hear, how did you find out that she had been killed? Well, they came to the home and told us these oh, so-called. They, they came to Philadelphia and they wanted everything, phone call records, the whole deal. I don't know if they were detectives, FBI. I really don't remember, but all I do remember, they could have been local police or they could have, I think they were, they remember they were from San Diego. They came to tell her brother and my mom and me, it was us three living there and that she had been murdered. And it was a real gloomy day. But what had happened was all the letters, they, I remember they wanted copies of them. So I made, I kept the originals and made copies for them. I remember going around to the store because we, to the pharmacy, we didn't have staples and things like that then. And so it was really hard to make a copy of something, but I managed to, to do it. Copy now. Uh, yeah, what? Say what? Parking copies now. I know. But I did go to the, the pharmacy around the corner and I was making copies of, I said, I'm not giving them these letters. No way. Who the heck they think they're coming here to confiscate all, all the personals. And I, saved all them. Mm. And uh, mm. I put one in the book. So um, one letter is in the book. I'll do another book later, whatever, maybe put the others in. But anyhow, um, so that was that. And they came to tell us and then we, you know, we, we got the news and then they had gone out to her mom's home as well. And uh, because she had the direct contact with her brother at our home with us, me and her brother, um, it was all the time. She called us three times a week, you know, three, four times a week to tell us of everything. And the letter saying that she was homeless. Then she met a guy and started living with him. And then she didn't want to be with him because all he wanted was sex. And, you know, she said, well, he's putting a roof over my head. And I understand she was very level headed. She said, he is putting a roof over my head. And I do understand that he wants this as a payback, you know, uh, sex. But she says, she was too normal. She was like, not too normal, but normal in the sense of like, I just can't do it with him. If I'm living with him, it's different than a client. You see, you know, this. Oh, no, this I know. Oh, no, yeah. I know. Because it's, it's a form of extortion. You know, when you're being extorted for something, you know, like a roof over your head. Yeah, it's not fun. Right. So she said it was so bad that she, um, he would scream because she wouldn't, but she was getting a meal and a roof. She finally became a security guard, worked as a security guard, which is step up into becoming, say, a policeman. In a security guard job, you can get them at 17. And she got one where she was working at like, uh, I don't know, a hotel or something where you just greet people coming in. And those jobs were on and off. So when she didn't work the streets, she worked that or vice versa, a little bit of both. But she wanted to have that normalcy, which a lot of prostitutes do. They still want to keep that normal life and knowing that, you know, they're not, you know, you, you split yourself up. It's it's just what you do. And it's just what you do. And that's the way it is, you know. And so she did that for a while. And she left this guy and she was able to get her own apartment. And then she had a boyfriend. And then, I don't know, that kind of fizzled. But she did have her own apartment for a while. And she was able to pay. She had a horse. And she was grooming horses as a side job at one of the. Why not? Out. Yeah, she well, her and her brother, they had horses back here in, in Pennsylvania and they groomed them. Well, he did forever. He was always grooming and she did, too. So she fell in that same pattern as he, which is a good one. So she had her own horse. And then as a side job, she groomed horses. So that would probably give her a little income or maybe free rental of her horse. Something like that. Cool. Oh, wow. That's awesome. I yeah, I mean, that. she had in the back of the book. She's on the horse. One of the last pages in there, in the chapter, in one of the chapters. Well, at the very last chapter, she's on her horse. On the, it's the only picture of, I have of her on the horse, and her hair was starting to get a little blonde. Yeah, mm -hmm. like me, my hair was dark like that, and then we start using the sun in, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> the California sun in, and then all of a sudden she would have been total blonde. 
because our whole family did the same thing. <laughs> Everybody wanted to be bl blonde. You know, really, a lot of blondes are bottled. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know about you, but at least the, the Italian ones are. Blondes make more money. Yeah. I don't know. So, there's there's a big debate about that in the business. You know, more money is a blonde or a brunette. Oh, yeah. It's Here, a topic I'll of discussion you. constantly. Well, business is slow. You. Change your hair color. Oh, yeah. Here, I'll show you the picture. Here she is on the horse. Oh, awesome. Yes, I have the book. Yes. And her hair is a little blonde there. It's getting blonde. So, uh, but anyhow, yeah. So, so you guys knew something was wrong. You, you guys knew. Oh, she went, was no, she told us from the jail that right. her life is in danger. And in the letter. So even though letter, she, even though she had connections in the police department, she still ended up going to jail for prostitution. Yeah, but she got out of like 90 days, she only got 30 or 40 and she got a work for a low, which black put that in place. A work for a low, you go out nine to five and you come back. How great is that? Mm -hmm. And her, 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 she was, they cut off about three months. She, Black really took care of her in this way. He was the head of the prostitution unit. Oh, he was the head of the prostitution unit. Oh. Yes, Black, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Black. And she says in the letter, the one I have in the book, her life is in danger when I get out. She didn't want to so turn did she in. Know Black? Did Black know that her life was in danger? Well, here's what happened. When she went in to report Averick, and her attorney told her that she shouldn't. She was hanging out with her attorney's female lawyer because they had horses at the same place. So the female lawyer friend of hers that was shared an office with her attorney, uh, Holbrook, Douglas Holbrook, said, don't report, Larry. That's not a good thing to do. But, you know, and she didn't have any fear as a prostitute to walk in a police department because, you know, prostitutes, they walk in a police department and immediately get arrested. You're a prostitute, you know, whatever. But the thing is, she did not have that fear because... They all knew her. She had this kind of personality, this kind of networking. Well, they had she all was, probably arrested her. Well, they, they already knew her, but you still don't walk in a police department. No prostitute would do that. But she had this kind of resiliency, this courage, this fearlessness, and she had power. And she knew that they liked her. People liked her. Okay, so she walks in the police department, reports him. Then the can of worms opened, and Black went down with Averick. Black is not someone she reported. When she reported Larry, it was like she was doing them a, a favor because it was a blessing in but disguise. why did she they, report Larry? Why did she report him? She reported Larry because he kept harassing her, coming to her, to her apartment saying, I want those pictures. I want those pictures. Now, they were often on client, you know, client kind of thing, but she, she became fearful of him. He's, Larry, I'm going to say this, is a... I'm a psychotherapist. Larry is a sociopath. I know he is. He had this sociopathic way about him that a young girl like her could be fearful of him. And he used the badge as the, you know. So I she had all. pictures of her and him at she the Colorado of, River. She had pictures of the Colorado crowd, which included Kenneth Hargrove, um, Lieutenant Carl Black, a bunch of them with other work. Oh, yeah, working girls. And it was like an understood thing from the way I believe it to be. And Donna, he found out about it. And he said, show me the pictures. He wanted to bring the pictures to IA to show IA, look what your lieutenant's doing. And you fight, and you you demoted me five years ago for taking her on a ride along. Now look who your lieutenant's with. She got caught in the middle, okay? In the middle of job politics, of what's well, good for the goose should be good for the gander. Was, because her, um, got, her job was criminalized. If her job her, had not been criminalized, there there would not have been any, you know, right. basis upon which anybody would have been afraid of losing their job or or being demoted or, oh, right. you know, any anything like that. So you think it was because of the, what the, works, the line of work she was in? Because yeah. it was criminalized. It wasn't prostitution. Right. It was because it was criminalized. Okay. So, okay. Well, when she went to report Larry Averick, they, oh, they, they drilled her. They grilled and drilled her. And then she had to tell them that Black was paying my bail and getting me the work furlough. And 
getting, you know, so nobody knows that. That's like your own little secret that you do for your your people out there, you know, if you're a lieutenant or, or whatever. And that's oh my when God. They Anita, Anita, what if you're the sole Fulk County district attorney and you're investigating this, you know, serial killing case and you're going through the jail in Suffolk County, talking to people who've been convicted of prostitution about if they've had any contact with Rex and they're forthcoming about a bunch of information of relationships that they've had with cops. Mm. How do you think, how do you think that is going to affect the prosecution of the alleged serial killer? Because right. The Suffolk County is going to have to disclose all of these interviews and what everybody said and everybody's names to the defense attorney, to Rex's defense attorney. Okay. Mm. And so, you know, if people are going to be giving testimony in a trial because his, his trial is scheduled for next year, and they have to get up on the stand and talk about these complicated relationships with all these cops, like situation that Donna was in. Right, right. How is that going to play in front of a jury? In front of the in public? I don't know. How do you think it will play? It could, it could backfire. But you remember, the blue wall is the blue wall. So the blue wall, they stay together. You know, the police, mm. they stick together. They're the blue wall. They could do no wrong, but how would it play with the public? Uh, well, in this day and age that we're in, it might go against them because of the way police are targeted and being brought down for their actions or their different things now. You know, they profile people and they shoot for no reason. I mean, all that stuff, you know, we're in a, in a heavy duty police thing right now uh, throughout the world, throughout the United States. And uh, yeah, but I think- story is very important. You know, Donna's story informs us about what happens when you're working in a criminalized occupation and you have relationships with cops, that the criminalization puts you in proximity to police officers and right. and and you know people are just doing their regular lives partying you know going to the colorado liver, river with whoever um but because that money comes into the the relationship and it's criminalized now you know people have reason to be afraid and they see don as a threat and who sees her as a threat the, the, the police in San the Diego police. saw Donna as a threat. Right. Of course. Right. Because uh, after the testimony, you mean? Yeah. Before, yeah she publicly well, testifies. Right. Well, of course, they they could think that if she's getting them fired, she, she, what is she doing to me? <laughs> you know, everyone would go on the edge. And she did get set report seven other cops. It's one of the articles in the book. One of the, uh, she got seven other seven cops. Other cops? Yeah, well, that, let me see what that is. Um, she sure. reported, she reported seven. It's in here. Here it is. Gentilly filed city claim accusing seven cops. Here you go. It's mm -hmm. on page uh, 111, accusing mm -hmm. seven. So she accused them, but I believe they got slaps on the hands. They were doing some corruption, maybe drug, drug dealing or drug, trying to buy drugs. But why Holbrook was very, very adamant about this. Why would you put this kind of girl in this kind of she she became the informant after Averick was fired. She mm -hmm. did not bring Averick down as an informant. And Averick made it be like, well, she was an informant. And I was one of the cops she reported. No, when she reported him, the department saw a blessing in disguise. They didn't want Larry from the get go because he had some other issues with them. He just wasn't very well liked. And then they made her the informant so that she can get less jail time. But it was after. And then when you make someone an informant or because they want less jail time or whatever, you're working with them. They were to give her witness protection and they didn't. All they did was do a deadbolt on her door. That's the only thing they did. 
They did not give her the witness protection. Okay. Now they betrayed her in the letter I have in there. And it says that, and it says it in that letter, they betrayed her. Now, the thing is after she uh, became the informant, Okay, so maybe you think you're going to go out and report on people stealing packages at a door. No, they put her in the middle of a police sting. Go get the cops that are bad and bring them back to us. You already brought us Larry, and we didn't even hire wait, you to do wait, that. Wait, they put her in the middle of a prostitution sting operation? No, no. They put her in the middle of, you're going to be a police informant for us? You're going to report this is your job. It could be like, Go into houses, and if you see thieves doing packages, that's not what they gave her to do. Her job was to report on corrupt police. If you see a cop talking to a drug dealer or a prostitute, and they're trying to get something goody for themselves, mm -hmm. she had to report them. You get mm -hmm. it? So now yeah. her lawyer was adamant because he says, how could you put a prostitute to report on corrupt cops? Put her to do something else, like thieves in a store or something, people taking chewing gum out of a store. You don't put a prostitute informant that's looking to get less time. You know why they did that to her? Because they were grateful when she reported Larry. They wanted him out for years. He was a pariah. They wanted him out for years. He was a malcontent. I have that, those exact words in the book. So, so, they, so they wanted to use, they wanted to weaponize her to take yes. out some of the cops that they didn't like. Right. Like, and ones that they could give less pay, give a slap on the hand, get rid of them for two years. And then they come back, you know, department politics, money, status, you know, all of that. They, yeah, she was the weaponized, weaponized. Her lawyer was adamant because he says, how could you let this kind of girl go report on corrupt cops? She already made that testimony. And now you got to report all the, any cop could have killed her. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. See, this is the story as I know it to be. And I figured it all out from everything that I've been following and listening from the time I was 20 years old. And the thing is, Larry said she was an informant when she got me fired. No, she was not. You were harassing her. So Larry her lied to you. So he lied but to you. Oh, uh, yeah. We liked each other. I don't like him. He made bad review on Amazon about me with my book and said bad lied, things about he me. He lied to you. He liked me. And there's a lot mm -hmm. of things about Larry, a lot of phone calls that I got about him over the years that I don't even want to say on here because no, I don't no, know. No. It's a lot of things that I would tell you privately. And But the thing is, I liked him. He liked me. But he went like, and he went like, like a sociopath, go put some bad review on Amazon about me and things on social. Media. Oh, she's, she's trying to be, hey, you know, I'm an author and you're an author and I'm writing about my cousin so I can maybe get justice for our family. You're writing about something else. And that's great. I'm not in competition with people. I don't care. This is not about some book getting on a bestseller. It's about a book that's educational. You know, I'm teaching people. Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. You're teaching everybody about, you know, what happens when, you know, people are criminalized and they're cooperating with the police. Right. And criminalization creates, sets up this whole dynamic. And in Donna's case, it got her killed. Right. And, and her see, murder is unsolved. Her murder is unsolved to this right. day. And, and her, autop her autopsy, it was the only to be sealed in San Diego. And it still is. Now, what, what is the... Yes, you see, you don't know that. Her autopsy was the first and only to be sealed in San Diego. Look on the back of the cover of the book. It says it there. Why? It is still sealed. Now, David Gofferson, in 2015, CBS investigative reporter, went to, he went to the coroner's office back then, and I have that letter in the book, and it still looms over San Diego. People still want this aha moment. Who killed her? You know, they want that aha moment, right? Is so, there DNA evidence? Now, there's some stuff, but yes and no. But so anyway, they will not release and open that coroner uh, report, uh, the, the autopsy. Now, Streed just died. The detective Streed was on it for 30 years. And Streed was the only one that was working with the old timers. And he told me, let me do it. Let me do it. He was trying to get the people that had already retired to see if they had some input or some way of getting, you know, because it was sealed. Who seals an autopsy? The police department or the DA's office. Who does that? Okay. They're Her hiding autopsy. something. 
They're hiding something. Right. And you know what? Here's the thing. Donna was not only a victim, she was a suspect. She was a victim and a suspect. A suspect so, in what? Her own murder? What? Well, she was a suspect because she's a victim because she was murdered. Okay. She's a victim. But she was a suspect for whatever it was that they're covering up. Whoever did that, why would they kill her? For what reason? She knew something? What? She knew something? What did she know? What did she know that was so important? Somebody cheated or, on their wife? Huh? Or it was retaliation for telling. Retaliation for telling what? The Averick? And, and oh, so, okay, now, now let's look at Black. Let's take a look at Black. He's a big lieutenant. He must have got. Well, you know, Larry was whoo, beside himself. He could never work as a cop again, ever mm -hmm. from this. Now, Lieutenant was demoted, got the, the, the higher, the, you know, got back his status a year later and remained on the force till retirement. Mm -hmm. You know, Black could have very well hired a hitman. Or he could have done it himself. No, he wouldn't have. No, mm -mm. it would have been a hiring. These people hire. Come on. I think there's yeah. there's got to be some DNA evidence. That's why the autopsy is still sealed. Well, see, Larry in his book was saying that, and they're trying to say that Elliot Porter, the serial killer, did it. He did not do it because Elliot named the people he did, and Elliot did not do it. And they told our family back then that a serial killer did it, and we got him in jail. And oh, I sure. never, ever believed that because she called us up. I'm afraid to leave the jail. I don't know what to do. I can't leave my horse. I can't come back. This was the phone calls. These were the phone calls for like a couple of weeks. My horse. And you know how you get attached to an, a beloved animal and especially a horse and a girl in her shoes. That's where she found her love, her love, her, her healing, her nourishment. Yeah, why, should she, that, why was her life being threatened? She knew her life was being threatened. And she, and I said to her, and you know, I felt so guilty my whole life is why I had to do all this now as I got bigger uh, and I got more educated and more knowledgeable and cultured and whatnot, worldly. I uh, was always afraid to put the book out because I, I, when I first put this out, I got all these, I still get phone calls from detectives. I'm like, oh shit, am I the next to be murdered? You know, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? You get scared. Yeah. You, yeah. you get scared. And I'm thinking George Floyd and all this stuff out in the world. Hey, I'm doing it. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm doing it. And so no, the I thing appreciate was, that I, you did it. Everybody I should know. I, I, my whole life, I felt guilty that I didn't go. I just, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have money. I, Donna was, I was seven years older than her. So I didn't, I said, I got to go out there and get her. She's, she's not going to come back. She's going to leave that horse. She keeps saying she's going to be killed. I believe her. Nobody believed her in our, in our home. My mother, or her brother, they just thought she was talking. I said, no, she's sounding desperate. Somebody's going to kill no, her. her we attorney, got, we got, but her attorney I, believed her. Her attorney, her attorney and I her did. Attorney knew, and, and, and everybody else around her knew, like all those cops, and they did nothing. They took no steps. To right. Her. They took no steps. Isn't that horrible? And yeah, you know it what? horrible. it's horrible. You know, the blue wall or like she's a woman. Oh, forget about it. She was a woman. 1985. Whew, women didn't have a voice. But the thing is, Let I alone serve on the police force. Right. And she wanted to be a cop. And, you know, I felt so bad. I didn't go get her. If I would have had much more, you know, if I was more like we are today, you know, you get on a plane, you go anywhere. I, I just said, I want to go get her, leave that horse. But she didn't want to leave her horse, Fantasia. So she, Anita, she should have been safe where she was. Mm, there you go. She should have That's been safe right. and, and, and been, you know, able to have her life right where she was and keep and her the, horse. And what got life. me was those other cops did not. And I'm sure they knew, people knew. She said everybody in the neighborhood knew. Their t people in the neighborhood were saying to her, get out of town. It was the biggest rumor. She's going to be killed. So somebody, do you think somebody, even just a low blow neighborhood, neighbor, a neighbor that's just some, you know, person that works in a, in a, in, in a plumbing shop or something would say, hey, let, let me, let me help you. you. You know, let me save you. No, all the people. Forget about they're the cops. all afraid of the cops. They're all afraid of the police. Of the cops. And everyone, they all, the blue wall, you could see they're sticking together. But she mm -hmm. said, everybody in town is telling me to leave. Everybody, the guy in the grocery store, the girl down the street, this one, that one. 
I said, well, listen, let's go. Come on. And I, and no one said, let me save you. you or even, or yeah, a cop, you even, even a cop, you know, right. and they, they got her at that vulnerable moment. You know, it's always that vulnerable moment. And it's, it's a sad thing. And this looms, this story looms. There was no reason for this girl, this young girl to not have her life. That's right. I don't care. I don't care what she knew, sex, politics, whatever, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Everything's out in the open today. Everything's Everything. out in the open. This is the other thing that gets me, Anita. You know, last month in San Diego, they had uh, the Comic Con convention. Mm, you said, and, yeah. Yeah. It goes on in San Diego. You know, it's been I've been, going I've been to it. I used to go to it. Go ahead. But tell me about it. So, well, you know what? Let me play the news report, the news report, if I can, about what they did at Comic-Con. Um, Comic-Con, it. it's the ultimate trade. But what law enforcement found behind some masks was not just cosplay. In here, everybody's like a disguise. It's like Halloween. Okay, they feel like they are invisible. Director of Bilateral Safety Corridor Coalition, Marissa Ugarte, is cheering on the 35 to 50 undercover officers with the San Diego Human Trafficking Task Force working Comic-Con daily to make so many arrests. Finding these buyers, uh, you know, or predators of the 14 people arrested, for me was like 10 women one of them just 16 years old the rest in their 20s and 30s were liberated from their traffickers in this sting operation ugarte's organization will be caretaking some of those adults we do crisis intervention we do case management we find them jobs housing and everything san diego ranks 13th for human trafficking among a list of large cities the state attorney general who organized this Comic-Con sting, says that he's working sex trafficking cases here all year round. During Comic-Con, task force members posed undercover as sex buyers to contact potential victims and arrest their attackers. Fake advertisements soliciting sex were also posted to arrest further buyers. We will uh, detect you. Uh, we will uh, dismantle your operation. We will arrest you and hold you accountable. The 14 arrested face solicitation charges. Attorney General Rob Bonta tells NBC7, large events that draw hundreds of thousands of people, like Comic-Con, attract traffickers and sex buyers. These events, unfortunately, often uh, come with a heightened level of human trafficking activity. The Attorney General says there were numerous sex trafficking arrests in the months leading up to Comic-Con. For someone whose organization takes credit for liberating over 3,000 victims since its creation in 2005. Anita? Yeah, how about that? Mm. 35 to 40 police officers putting together fake ads Mm, in, in San Diego? In San Diego, last month, late last month when oh, they had Comic-Con in July, they put together fake ads to be able to arrest people, adults, for prostitution. Now, what? where do they run these fake ads? They run them on all of our websites. They take our images. They steal our photos, and they post ads with our photos. So they, they steal our photos. <laughs> They right, catch right. our customers and they so, catch workers. So they didn't arrest the workers. They trafficked the workers into this nonprofit because they decided all the workers were sex trafficking victims, regardless of if they were actual sex trafficking victims or not. They didn't make any arrests for sex trafficking. Um, they arrested the customers for, you know, prostitution, a misdemeanor prostitution. You've got, so this is my point, Anita, 35 to 40 officers in San Diego are being paid to make misdemeanor prostitution arrests and they cannot solve Donna's murder. You know, it's know. a misuse, it's a misuse of the police's finite public resources. Mm. And so, you know, that that is a problem for the public safety, right? 
that's a problem for the safety of prostitutes because now the women that they arrested for prostitution are in Donna's situation, right? Yes. They're in Donna's situation where they're having to go, well, I can claim I'm a sex trafficking victim and go to this nonprofit and receive some fake, you know, social services that I don't really need because I'm on the street because the social services are bunk anyway, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, is the social safety net in our country, right? Right, right, right. So, so here is the San Diego Police Department. So I want to reach out to the mayor. Yes, of San, uh, who's the mayor over there now? His name is Todd uh, Gloria. Uh, okay. And so I want to reach out to him and uh, talk to him. And, you know, there's some other sex worker activists down there in San Diego that I want to reach out to. Um, mm. Because I think that, you know, it's important to, um, you know, get them connected to Donna's story and to help reframe the public's attention and their finite resources on solving these murders. You know, California had over 900 unsolved murders in 2022. How many? Over 900. Oh, God, that's a lot. Well, here they are arresting people for prostitution and telling the public they're rescuing people from being sex trafficked when nobody's being arrested for being a sex trafficker. They're well, yeah, but the, the charge is the same. Prostitution, sex trafficking charge is the same. You no, know that. No, not, not here in California. Prostitution are misdemeanor charges. Sex trafficking is forcing somebody to work and that's a felony. Okay. That's, that's, okay. That's the minimum eight I years. Thought, I thought the charge of prostitution, if a girl's at a massage parlor doing prostitution, she gets arrested. It's a sex trafficking charge. Is that so? Not in, not in California. So that would be true in some of the other states where they've renamed um, basic prostitution enterprise business activities as sex trafficking. Yeah. Okay. So, but, right. but yeah. So, and here's our attorney general, Rob Bonta. You know, making mm. these old public statements about stopping these human trafficking, you know, operations. There are no human trafficking operations. Nobody was arrested right, for right. being a sex trafficker. We did a public records request in 2020 and 21. And we asked Rob Bonta, we asked the state attorney general of California, how many sex trafficking cases have you adjudicated in that, in that two year period? You know how many? Three. Yeah, that's what I thought. Three. Three. Three cases. Right. Three right, cases. Right. So you're using the 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 police power of 35 to 40 police officers to make prostitution arrests on individuals, on yeah, individual working women, and, and right. our customers. And you can't be, you know, renaming our customers as sex traffickers. They're not sex. Right. And they're and they're arresting them when they could be going out to get bigger operations like real sex trafficking. Well, there aren't a lot of operations, but my point is, is that there's these unsolved murders. And Donna's unsolved murder and they need to solve Donna's murder. They need yes, to un together. They need, we'll autopsy. they need to find out if there's any DNA. I bet you there's some DNA in there. Well, there is DNA because in that report that I have, but it has to be matched up in the new system now. And I don't know, 2015 was the last that the uh, CBS reporter went on to it. I was told by Tom Street, who just died a month ago, um, that he said, do not go to the coroner's office being a family member because they will, we're trying to get them not to destroy what's left. Something like that. Because remember, this is a cover up. You see, it's a cover up. Yeah. Donna was was Donna was a whistleblower. Donna yeah. was the whist. She was a whistleblower, and yeah. so now they it, it's a cover up. Uh, and they had, you know, I've gotten so many calls from people. Some other guy called me once and said something that she knew CIA people and secret agent people, and there were all kinds of sexual things going on. And 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 you know, they're a secret. They're a secret service and CIA, whatever they are. Who killed and Donna? She... We want to know who killed Donna. We want somebody held accountable 
Your family needs that. Your family deserves that. Our community needs of that. Of course. We need that, and, Justin. And the San Diego community needs it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So maybe you can find out who is taking over Donna's case now. If somebody well, is taking I it over. I have somebody. I have somebody, but he's, I have one detective now. I have a different one that I was just put the ad. I just, the people from The Sun interviewed me. Right. I was at the crime, crime con in that. I went to crime con in Nashville. I go to the crime con every year. He did an interview and I have a new person that he has that's on her case, but he said he practically blew him off the phone. Like it's a cold case and there's no information. It was like, hello, goodbye. Well, we'll see if we can't get some of the, some of the internet, internet sleuths on it here and, you know, see what we can find. Um, but maybe we'll communicate offline because we got to wrap up now. We've been yes. for an hour. It's been great talking to you. Uh, we can have a follow-up conversation, but let's follow up with um, the city officials and get our letters and our phone calls and get those meetings going um, with, with those people and see what they're doing to find who killed Donna and get them held accountable. We have yes. to do it. Okay. Yes, we'll do it as a team. Let's do it. Yeah. It's coming. The light is coming. <laughs> but this it will is. be my big thing when when it does, you know. See, I know she's not resting and I could feel it. We're we're first cousins, you know, you feel those things, you know. You do. You feel that biologics. So and I'm very intuitive and very, you know, yoga and all this. So, you know, you sort of have that whole whatever going on. You know what I mean? That California thing. That California thing. But anyway, well, I'm so glad you uh, interviewed me. I thank you very much, Maxine. And I'm so glad to be here with you. And if anybody wants information, the Donna Gentili story.com, that's the website. You can get me there. Yeah, I'll put all that stuff in the show notes for people. And um, I'll send you a link and you can upload to your. I'm uploaded all over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you All for right. your time. It's been a pleasure talking with you and sure. getting to hear about Donna more and, um, and we can work together. We can get this done. Yes. Yes. I would like that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to you later, Anita. All right. Bye.